right, guys, welcome back to the Road to Success MCAT Test Prep Series. This video is also one of my favorites, and it's called Genetics and Evolution. Now, I like Genetics and Evolution because it's so much more straightforward to understand than other concepts in biology, which are super nitty-gritty, talking about the micros of anatomy and physiology. That being said, just because it's easy to understand doesn't mean you don't have to pay attention or you don't have to put in the effort to learn. There's going to be a lot of practice involved, and I highly recommend that you guys put it in the effort and get this stuff down as it's easy points. That being said, I'll be starting off with a discussion about Mendel's laws, and I'll be moving on to applying them to mutations. I will then discuss Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, and I will end it off by talking about the different types of evolution paths. That being said, let's jump right into this video, and we'll be starting off with a very, very quick and interesting activity about Punnett squares. All right, let's start this video off with a fun little exercise on Punnett squares. Punnett squares are diagrams that predict the relative genotypic and phenotypic frequencies that result from the crossing of two individuals. Genotypes are the genetic makeup of the uh, person in, uh, in particular, and the phenotype is their physical appearance that we can see on the outside world. Alleles of two parents are arranged on the top and side of the square, the genotypes of the progeny represented at the intersections. So for the sake of this, I will be referring to the father as the one on top here, and for the mother as the one down here. Alleles can be distributed to either dominant or recessive. So dominant is usually uh, going to be a capital letter, so I'm going to use capital A as the dominant allele, while the lowercase a is usually, or a lowercase letter, is usually a recessive allele. 99% of the time this will be the case, but if it's not, or like sometimes it's not, you have to read the passage and make sure that you're um, getting this right, because MCAT, they, they like trick you. Uh, that being said, let's just jump into, right into it. I'll do a very basic uh, Punnett square. Uh, but first off, let's talk about homozygous, heterozygous, uh, recessive, and dominant. So homozygous dominant will be something like a, A, capital A, capital A, this will be dominant, homozygous. While A, A is homozygous recessive. Now, you could also cross it and get A, A as like this a capital and a lowercase, where it'll be heterozygous. I want to state this by saying that homozygous dominant will always uh, present, well, hom if it's crossed with homozygous recessive, this will yield and will be, uh, will be masked by the homozygous dominant trait. So I'll actually do it right here by crossing a homozygous father with homozygous dominant father with the homozygous recessive mother. So by doing that, you take the A here and you cross it with the A here and you get a result like this. And you can just copy that for all four of these since it's just going to be A, 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 A. So like I was saying before, uh, the lowercase A will get masked by the uppercase A as it's recessive while this is dominant, but the A is still present. So when this child has offspring, so I'll, I'll use it right here. So this child has an off, has offspring with, let's say, a homozygous dominant uh, mother. This will end up looking a bit like this. A, 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 A. Oops, sorry. A, 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 A. Yeah, sorry, I got a bit too trigger happy with the A's. But yeah, you can see uh, A crosses with A, uppercase A crosses with uppercase A, and it causes two uppercase A's, so these are completely homozygous dominant, while these are still heterozygous. That being said, we redo this, uh, this one really quick, and you'll see A, uppercase A, lowercase A, with two lowercase A's. So a homozygous recessive mother. So it'll be heterozygous, homozygous recessive, heterozygous, homozygous recessive. Now, I'm keeping this uh, 
empty on purpose because I want to use this for a different one, but we will be covering, or I will do one more for the sake of the exercise with two heterozygotes, where it'll cause one homozygous dominant uh, offspring, two heterozygous offspring, and one homozygous recessive offspring. That being said, all of this what we just did is called a monohybrid cross because we crossed one trait. That trait could either be shown as dominant or recessive. So for this one, it would be something like hair length. Dominant hair is long, short, or, uh, recessive hair is short. But what if we need to talk about two different traits? Like is the hair long and wavy? Or is it like short and straight? Or long and straight? That's where dihybrid crosses come in. These can take two different variables and analyze them on one large Punnett square. So for this one, this, uh, this allele will be uh, capital R crosses with uh, capital Y and lowercase y. Lowercase r also crosses with capital Y and lowercase y. So it'll be written as capital R, lowercase r, capital Y, lowercase y. And as we can see here, this is capital R, lowercase r, with capital Y, lowercase y. This can lead to 16 different variables, and you need to, this is going to be a bit difficult for you guys at first, but with practice, you should be able to get it down. So, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 3, 3, 1. Yeah, so the, uh, the ratio for a heterozygote, a heterozygote uh, cross like this is 9, 3, 3, 1. Starting with the dominant, to heterozygotes, to recessive. That being said, the last uh, concept I want to talk to you guys of Punnett squares are sex links crosses. So with these, you'll always see them in the cases of X's and Y's, because the X chromosome represents uh, females, while the Y chromosome represents males. So by crossing a male and a female here, we'll be able to see that if you cross them normally, you have a 50% chance of getting a uh, daughter or a 50% chance of getting a son. Now, let's add a, recess, a, a sex-linked recessive trait into this. Colorblindness is the key example here. So I'll do, it'll usually be like a lowercase h on top of an x. So let's say that the wife is, uh, the wife doesn't have colorblindness, but she is a carrier. So she has an x, uh, an h here. The, the father doesn't have colorblindness, so there will be no h. So if we cross them together, you'll see that X, X causes uh, a healthy daughter. X, Y, we'll call it a healthy son. X, uh, H with X causes a daughter that is healthy, but she's a, uh, a carrier. And X, H, and Y will cause a son with colorblindness. Meaning that 0% of the daughters will have it, but 50% of the sons will. That being said, if the... This is very, very rare, but if a daughter actually has color blindness, both daughters will have it, or will have the uh, carrier, but they won't uh, express it, while both sons, or 100% of sons, will carry that trait. All right, that's all I have for you guys with Punnett squares. Let's move on to some fundamental concepts of genetics. <clears throat> Let's start off with penetrance. Penetrance is a population measure defined as the proportion of individuals in the population carrying the allele who actually express that phenotype. In other words, it's the probability that given a, a particular genotype, a person will express that phenotype. Alleles can be classified by their degree of penetrance. Hunting, Huntington's disease is a great example as it's caused by an expansion of a re repetitive sequence in the Huntington gene. Individuals with more than 40 sequences or 40 sequence repeats will have what is called full penetrance. 100% of those individuals with this allele will show symptoms of Huntington's disease. Individuals with fewer sequence repeats will show high penetrance, meaning most, but not all of them, will show this allele or will show uh, symptoms of that disease. With fewer sequence repeats, the genes will come down to reduced penetrance. And eventually, if there's no repeats, it'll be no penetrance. 
Moving on, let's talk about expressivity. This is defined as varying phenotypes despite having identical genotypes. If expressivity is constant, all individuals will have with the given phenotype or genotype. I'm so sorry, with the given genotype will express the same phenotype. However, if expressivity is variable, the individuals with the same genotype might have different phenotypes. Note that penetrance is a population parameter, while expressivity rep rep reflects on the gray area in expression and is based on the individual level. So I'll write here, penetrance is population, while expressivity is individual. Moving on, let's talk about Mendel's laws. Mendel's law of segregation is his first law, and it has four basic tenets. It states that genes exist in alternate forms called alleles. Any organism has two or any yeah, any organism has two alleles for each gene, and each of them or each one is inherited from each parent. Two alleles segregate during meiosis, resulting in gametes that only carry one allele for that trait. And lastly, if two alleles of an organism are different, only one will be fully expressed and the other will be fully silent. The expressed allele is said to be dominant, while the silent allele is recessive. Now, there are some other uh, issues such as co-dominance and incomplete dominance, but that doesn't apply to Mendelian genetics. This first law correlates to the separation of homologous chromosomes during anaphase of meiosis 1. We've talked about this in the reproduction video, so if you're fuzzy on that, please watch that one. Actually, I'll write this here too. Moving on, let's talk about Mendel's second law, the law of independent assortment. This one basically discusses the concept of recombination, where small segments of genetic material are swapped between chromatid, chromatids and homologous chromosomes resulting in novel combinations of alleles that were not present in the original chromosomes. The segregation of these homolog homologous chromosomes and their independent assortment increases the genetic diversity of their gametes by a lot. This is what allows uh, organisms that sexually reproduce to have a lot more survivability than asexual or um, stuff like bacteria that are not able to sexually reproduce. Now, I want to state that this, uh, that this one happens during prophase 1. Again, this is in that reproduction video. So if you're fuzzy, feel free to watch that one again. Now, lastly, let's talk about how DNA is, is proven to be genetic material. This was done in an iconic experiment by Frederick Griffith in the 1920s. He injected his, uh, his test mice with various different strains of diseases to see if they will live or die based on what it is. He started off with a rough strain, which was non-virulent, ended up ending up with the mouse living. Then he ended up, or and then he injected a smooth strain, which had the virus, causing the mouse to die. He, and he injected uh, another set of mice with heat-killed smooth strain, so the viruses were dead, but he still injected it with them, and the mouse, and the mouse ended up living. Lastly, he, uh, he added a rough strain and heat killed smooth strain into the mouse where the mouse ended up dying. This means that the virus's smooth strain entered inside the rough strain and it ended up being replicated inside the rough strain with the bacteria and the DNA exchange ended up killing the mouse because the virus inside of those bacteria ended up, going into, uh, ended up being exchanged with mouse cells and ended up entering their genome. Now let's talk about mutations. A mutation is a change in your DNA sequence that results in a mutant allele. The original one is usually called the wild type, while the mutant one usually has its own special name. So that being said, let's talk about various different types of nucleotide mutations. So this is our normal strain right here. A silent mutation uh, occurs when the change in the nucleotide has no effect on the final protein. This most commonly occurs when 
you, you like swap something out and it causes no change in the amino acid that's coded. So you can see right here, it goes from an A to a G, but it still expresses leucine. So nothing really happens. This is very, very common in the third nucleotide in a given codon because there is a degeneracy or wobble effect present here. Missense mutations occur when the change in nucleotide results in substituting one amino acid for another in the final protein. So they change the, the T here with the C, causing the leucine to become serine. That will end up causing some sort of effect in the protein. Now finally, nonsense mutations occur when the change in nucleotides result in substituting a stop codon or substituting in a stop codon for an amino acid. So right here, it changes it from TTA to a TGA that will cause a stop codon when it's transcribed. There are also stuff such as frame shift mutations where they shift it over from, or they add or delete one causing it to shift over one amino acid, creating several different uh, amino acids. Moving on, let's talk about chromosomal mutations. Deletion mutations are, would occur when a large segment of DNA is lost from a chromosome. Small deletion mutations are considered frame shift mutations as described just uh, now, previously. Duplication mutations occur when a segment of DNA is copied multiple times in the genome. Inversion mutations occur when a segment of DNA is reversed within the chromosome. Insertion mutations occur when a segment of DNA is moved from one chromosome to another. Small ins insertion mutations, including those where the inserted DNA is not from another chromosome, are considered frame shift mutations. And lastly, translocation mutations occur when a segment of DNA from one chromosome is swapped with a segment of DNA from another chromosome. Let's talk about the, con the consequences of mutations. So sometimes the mutation can be very advantageous. This can incur a positive selective advantage that allows the organism to produce fitter offspring. This is how evolution occurs. A good example of this in modern times though would be sickle cell anemia. This is caused by a single nucleotide mutation that causes sickled hemoglobin. While the disease itself is detrimental, heterozygotes of sickle cell anemia have minor symptoms and they are also naturally resistant to malaria. Thus, heterozygotes for sickle cell anemia have a selective advantage because they are less likely to die from malaria. This is called heterozygote advantage. That being said, other, other mutations can be detrimental or dele deleterious. For example, uh, xeroderma pigmentosum, or XP, is an inherited defect in the nucleotide excision repair mechanism. Patients with XP have DNA that is damaged by UV radiation and cannot be appropriately repaired. UV radiation can cause cancer-causing mutations and since there's no repair mechanism, patients with XP are frequently diagnosed with malignancies, especially of the skin. Moving on, let's talk about leakage. G genetic leakage is a flow of gene be genes between species. In some cases, individuals from different but closely related species can mate to produce hybrid offspring. These would be stuff like mules or ligers. These offspring aren't able to reproduce, though, because they have odd numbers of chromosomes. However, a hybrid can reproduce with members of one species or the other. Or, well, sometimes. This is, uh, this is actually a bit of a, an unstudied or understudied topic, where mules uh, have been known to not be able to reproduce. However, some others, such as uh, the beefalo, which is a cross between the American bison and cattle is able to reproduce with one species or another. That being said, they cannot reproduce with each other. And moving forward, let's talk about genetic drift. Genetic drift refers to changes in the composition of the gene pool due to chance. Genetic drift tends to be more pronounced in smaller populations. The founder effect is a more extreme case of genetic drift in which a small population 
finds itself in reproductive isolation from other populations of the same species due to natural barriers. This is also called the bottleneck, def bottleneck effect. This will drastically reduce the size of, population of the population available for breeding. Because the uh, breeding population becomes so much smaller, inbreeding or mating between two related individuals will occur and will end up causing uh, homozygosity, which will increase the prevalence of both homozyg homozygous dominant and recessive traits, and it will also end up causing what is called inbreeding depression. This will decrease fitness and uh, genetic variety and will eventually lead to a, a lots of various different birth defects and possibly the extinction of that population. Lastly, let's move on to evolution. I'll start off with the Hardy Weinberg principle, as this is what is uh, going to be, this will most likely be tested. And it basically, it provides a theorem for testing out allele frequency. The f there is five criteria that are mandatory for this to be possible, though, in which the population is very large, meaning there's no genetic drift, there are no mutations affecting the gene pool, uh, mating between the individuals is random, there's no migration, and the genes in the population are all equally successful at being reproduced. So that being said, I'm going to write out what the uh, Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium is. So I'll start off with P plus Q squared equals 1 squared. Uh, that being said, since they're all squ both squared, you can actually get rid of these, and it's P plus Q equals 1. The more advanced part of it, though, is P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared equals 1. So P and Q can either be the dominant allele or the recessive allele. I usually make P dominant and Q recessive. So moving on, let's talk about the different types of natural selection and evolution. Starting off with directional selection, directional selection states that that adaptive or sorry directional state uh, selection states that an adaptive pressure can lead to the emergence and dominance of an initially extreme phenotype this will push the initial trait from the initial population uh towards something that is a lot more extreme so like much larger beaks or bigger muscles something like that Meanwhile, stabilizing selection keeps these phenotypes within a specific range by selecting against the extremes. This is what allows us to, uh, for human body or for human birth weight to be within a narrow area. If it's too uh, low, it'll be it, it won't be healthy for the child. If it's too heavy, it'll be not healthy for the mother to, de to deliver. So that's why we end up uh, pop are stabilizing at the middle. And lastly, destructive selection. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. This is destructive selection. But what I said was what I was saying before, where we select towards the extremes. So you want a bigger beak to get uh, seeds deeper in, or you want a shallow beak if you if you're working with shallow trees as a bird, stuff like that. And then directional selection. It's pretty straight uh, straightforward. Uh, if you ha if it only once uh, sort of selection is preferred, you'll be going towards that area. Moving on, let's talk about the concepts of uh, evolution. There are three different ways that you can evolve. Divergent evolution refers to the independent de development of dissimilar characteristics in two or more lineages sharing a same ancestor. So this right here is divergent. So you meet at a breakoff point, or you guys grow together, but then you meet at a breakoff point, and they develop into different species. Parallel uh, evolution refers to the process where related species, although different, will evolve in similar ways for a long period of time in response to various different environmental selections. 
So this can be different species of birds developing the same way to fly. And finally, we have convergent evolution. This refers to the independent development of similar characteristics in two or more lineages which don't share a common ancestor. This will be, let's say, fish and dolphins. They, one is a mammal, one, or one, one is fish, one is a mammal, and they end up developing very, very similar traits because they both are in the water. They evolve certain features in adapting to the conditions of, uh, of aquatic life. That being said, I believe that's all I have for you guys today. This covers everything you need to know about genetics and mutation. Genetics, mutations, and evolution. Sorry. Uh, but I mostly want you guys to focus on genetics because that's going to be the, what's most tested on the exam. Uh, mutations is important as well. And evolution, honestly, is pretty straightforward and it's an easy, easy, they're easy points. So uh, make sure you guys cover everything in this video. That being said, that's all I have for you guys today. I hope you guys were able to learn something. Have a great rest of your day and happy studying.